Welcome to another installment of Lorewise, a series where we rank the strength of every boss in a game according only to the lore. Today we're going into one of my favourite games of all time, Sekiro. Sekiro is one of a few From Software games that wears its lore on its sleeve, but naturally this is only half the picture. By compiling item descriptions, community insights, environmental details, in-game narration and many other sources of information, I've consolidated what I believe to be an accurate ranking. In this video, I've included all bosses that have a unique memory associated with them, and also any that show a shinobi executed or immortality severed title when defeated. In this list, I've even added the gauntlet bosses as they share a very unique place in the overall narrative of the game, as you'll find out. I love this series and try to put in the hours to get things right. So if you've enjoyed them so far and are looking forward to more in the future, let YouTube know by subscribing. As a small YouTube channel, small bits of engagement are a massive boost to both the videos and my motivation to making each of these videos better than the last. But enough from me, let's get into the first ranking. Right at the bottom of the list, we have the folding screen monkeys. The nature of these monkeys is less of a threatening challenge and more so a logical blockade for us in progressing through Senpo Temple. While many aspects of Sekiro's bosses lend themselves to symbolism, the folding screen monkeys do this more outwardly than any other boss on this list. Reimagining and bringing to life the old proverb, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. The folding screen monkeys are an inherent test of wit rather than strength. While it's true the white-robed monkey that slyly follows the character creating monkeys to attack you do test our combat prowess, it's more so a hindrance than a challenge. None of the monkeys demonstrate any meaningful threat to life, and they utilise their segment of the old saying by harbouring aspects of the saying. The see no evil monkey will run away when it sees you approaching, while the speak no evil monkey will alert others on your approach. The challenge really asks the budding shinobi to abandon the brute strength that has got them this far in favour of a methodological approach that challenges the mind instead. It's for this reason the monkeys land themselves this low of a position on the list, as the most they could do in comparison to the other entries lore-wise is survive, and the least they could do is, well, die. As the final hurdle between you and the Divine Child, the folding screen monkeys act as the Hall of Illusion's final great illusion, but fall short of any notable power either of their own or as a totality placing themselves well below all the other entries on this list. On the theme of monkeys, while both the Guardian Ape and the Headless Apes are respective encounters of their own, I'll be ranking them as a totality here on the list. The story of the Guardian and Headless Ape are the stark reminder that the rejuvenating waters of the Fountainhead Palace are more present in the fabric of Ashina than meets the eye. What is likely an ordinary animal, the guardian ape is a natural born resident of the sunken valley. The first time we encounter the sunken valley is through the words of the sculptor. As we'll find out later in the list, the sculptor spent much of his youth as a budding shinobi in the valleys, honing his own talent as a skilled warrior, but also imitating the dexterous movements of apes. He would become so well versed in this that he, according to himself, would move just like an ape. This of course is echoed by his alliance as the orangutan. We also know he was not alone in this campaign for power. The sculptor too had a peer that would join him as they travelled through the sunken valleys, winning every battle in near perfection as anything less would cause them to succumb to the environment. From the items dropped by the guardian ape, we learn that the sculptor's peer was known as King Fisher, a woman that would match orangutan's flexibility and acted as an equal during this period of his life. The sculptor tells us King Fisher would dart around the sunken valley and her ring would whistle through the area indicating her movements. We also learn this whistling would cause the wildlife to turn into a frenzy. One day this whistling would stop 
and knowing of her fate, this would lead Orangutan to leaving the valleys and joining Ashina in its bloody coup. The loss of Kingfisher may even be attributable to Orangutan's rage on the battlefield, a story we'll go into more detail in the future. As we can obtain Kingfisher's ring by killing the guardian ape, we know it was a fact that this ape would bring an end to her life. This is important in the context to strength as this gives us the clear indication that the guardian ape was more ferocious than a shinobi that stood adjacent to the great orangutan. A man so powerful he would later go on to becoming one of the most successful soldiers in the Ashina army. Something so prevalent he would be the only being in the game to come in close to becoming Shura, if we exclude ourselves of course. While it is a stretch to assume that when Kingfisher died, she was parallel to the strength of Orangutan at the point he was about to become Shura, it's still likely she was a shinobi unparalleled by a majority of those already in the game, and the Guardian Ape being able to outmatch her make the Guardian Ape comparatively as strong as her, if not more so. While an ordinary large ape would be no challenge for the Kingfisher, we know the guardian ape in question was more than just ordinary, as the sunken valley sits directly below what we later come to understand as the Fountainhead Palace and the source of the rejuvenating waters. We learn this ape had a penchant for quenching his thirst in these waters. This would eventually cause the ape an unnaturally resilient lifespan and an unmatched resistance to ordinary weaponry. We know Kingfisher was able to actually get the upper hand and land a death blow against the Guardian Ape as evidenced by the deep laceration across its head, but unfortunately for Kingfisher, the Guardian Ape at this point was already possessed by a centipede of the rejuvenating waters. While we'll go into the lore of the centipedes and coming entries, what we need to know here is that this infection would grant certain beings near immortality, something we can witness firsthand when we decapitate it only for a second encounter to show a centipede emerge from its body. The Guardian Ape combined the immortality of the centipedes of the rejuvenating waters with an immense size and power to match. Holding the accolade for taking down a shinobi adjacent to the Great Orangutan demonstrates that it's not an easy battle. However, as it is bestial in instinct, it lacks the elaborate and trained skills of those that will come after and solidify this position on the list. In truth, there is not a whole lot to say specifically about the Corrupted Monk herself. We learn the Corrupted Monk in the version we meet her is an apparition of a truer form we meet later in the game at the Fountainhead Palace. The story of the Corrupted Monk starts with a woman named Yao, a priestess associated with the Okami tribe of warrior women. Her name Yao is likely a reference to the real-life Japanese myth of Yao Bikuni, who consumed a magical carp known as a Nino, a mermaid-like fish that granted immortality. The immortality would predicate Yao's future as one of a mystical nun. While not a one-to-one -one retelling, the Sekiro take on this story helps us understand the corrupted monk as having potentially been granted immortality through the consumption of a Nino or its equivalent in Sekiro, which would be the Great Carps of Fountainhead Palace. We learn the Dragon Spring in its stagnant form would lay the conditions for centipedes to infest the waters. If we look at one of the former Great Carp carcasses on the bottom of the main lake in the Fountainhead Palace, you'll actually be able to spot small all glowing centipedes all over its decaying corpse. More prominently in the narrative of centipedes is that all of those that seek immortality through consuming the dragon spring waters succumb to being possessed by a stagnation of their own life force, which in turn is represented by the centipedes eventually taking a hold of the host's body. While we've seen this in the case of the guardian apes, we see this too in other beings such as Hanbei and of course the corrupted monk in its true form. 
But how powerful was the corrupted monk in this true form? Well, it's likely the monk descends from the Okami tribe, or at least is affiliated to the tribe to some degree. Being associated with the Okami tribe grants a high degree of merit to the fighting prowess of the monk, as of course, this tribe once hosted one of the greatest shinobis of the entire timeline, Tomoe. Tomoe's way of combat was said to resemble a form of dancing. This is echoed by a variety of the Okami monks in the Fountainhead Palace and extended to the corrupted monk too. When we understand the role the Okami find themselves dutied with at this point of the game as defenders of the passage to the Divine Dragon, and then we perceive the corrupted monk in its true form as what is likely their final defense mechanism against anyone attempting to confront the Divine Dragon, we can assume the corrupted monk was at the height of the Okami hierarchy of warrior monks. While the previous entry of the Guardian Ape shares a similar origin to the Corrupted Monk, it's the monk's heritage as a high-ranking Okami warrior dutied with such a sensitive task that places her above even in her spirit form. While the spirit form does not hold the merit of having an aspect of the rejuvenating waters that grant an incredibly resilient body such as that of the guardian apes, as an extension of the true corrupted monk, this entry still remains a much deadlier threat than what we can expect of the guardian ape on the merit of its association to the legendary Okami tribe. Emma, much like the sculptor, is a figure that follows us all the way through the game. Initially understood to be nothing more than an altruistic doctor aligned to Kuro and our own mission. While the majority of the game revolves around this narrative, there is a much more confrontational version of her we can unveil through certain events of the game. Her story coincides with the sculptors. Indeed, exposition for either character helps us understand the other in more depth. Emma's story, according to her own retelling, begins at the aftermath of a certain battle, likely during the events of Ashina's coup, placing her own story close to our own. In this, she was left abandoned in the aftermath, but unlike us, she was greeted by a purely benevolent figure, the orangutan, who of course is the Elias for the present day sculptor. She tells us, And then there was a monkey eating a rice ball. A monkey? Maybe an ape. Maybe. Either way, he made it look so delicious. I remember being angry at that, but then, then he gave me the rice ball. After being gifted the rice ball, we learn Emma would follow Orangutan and Orangutan would eventually accept safeguard over the young girl. At this point, Orangutan was far too dangerous of a shinobi to look after the young Emma and would point Emma towards a doctor named Dogen. Dogen, renowned for his medical proficiency, was a perfect candidate for raising this girl in a non-hostile environment. It's likely Orangutan knew the perils of being a shinobi and in good faith, saw that Emma was not raised in this same environment. Having grown up under the tutelage of Dogen, she would demonstrate a keen eye to his medicinal practices and even as a child would stand out as a worthy apprentice to Dogen. We learn while she became proficient at treating regular wounds, she would hit a brick wall when it came to the Dragon Rock Plague, a disease brought upon those around the late Tomoe and Takeru. We learn those with the dragon's heritage, such as ourselves, are destined to be immortal, but at the cost of sapping the life of those around you, hence creating dragon rot, an incurable fatal illness. Upon our entry into the story, her goals therefore already align to ours, as at the heart of Kuro's commands are severing the dragon's heritage and therefore the condition for dragon rot. In this, Emma will continue aiding us on our journey as our dedicated medical practitioner. But we also know that Emma is not only aiding us or even Kuro, but more than anything, she seems aligned closest to Ishin. Although it's unclear when her tutelage with Ishin began, it's likely due to Dogen having a close relationship to Ishin and Ishin taking favor towards the young Emma. 
As we learn of the dialectical antagonisms between Ishin and Genichiro, we understand that although Ishin shares a vision of saving Ashina, he detests the route in which Genichiro has gone down to materialize this reality, and there are clues to suggest Emma advised Ishin on the nature of Dragon Rot being associated with the Immortal Dragon's heritage that brought him to this realization. Ishin on the same page as Kuro and Emma are therefore seeking a means to stop Genichiro from obtaining and perpetuating the Dragon Rot. Which of course would mean ending the Dragon's heritage rather than allowing Genichiro to perpetuate it. We also learn that Emma under Ishin would also learn of the Ashina fighting style. When we ask her why, she eventually tells us she has no intention to use it against ordinary people only demons, foreshadowing our own confrontation with her in the Shura ending. While we don't get a real telling for how powerful she was, we know she became a shinobi on the back of Ishin's tutelage, something that only few others have had the chance to do. We know Ishin would be present during the training of other Ashina shinobis, but we are never told he would mentor them on a one-to-one -one basis. This is exclusive to Emma. Immediately this puts Emma much higher than any regular Ashina Shinobi as she was brought to the rank of Shinobi from the greatest warrior to ever exist. We also know Emma spent time with both Tomoe and Tekaru in the Divine Realm, watching both Genichiro and Tomoe during Genichiro's fighting lessons, further adding to her own dynamism around the art of war. It's not surprising therefore to take Emma's claim at face value that she would stand toe to toe against the demon if it had come to it. Surely then on this merit, Emma should land somewhere much higher than she already is. But in truth, Emma states herself that she is a doctor first, then a shinobi, and her combat prowess was more so a final safeguard against Orangutan in the case he would succumb to the weight of Shura. We never truly get any other context around Emma's fighting ability, nor does Ishin ever state the breadth of his teaching. Emma alludes to the fact that she has never got into a battle with a human before either, further dulling her assumed strength as a combatant against us. On the merit of her affiliation with Tomoe Genichiro, but more importantly as the sole mentee for Ishin, regardless of never fighting to any notable accolades, she stands tall as not only Ashina's greatest living medical practitioner, but one of its greatest shinobis too. There isn't too much to say here that wasn't already said for the Illusory Corrupted Monk. If you want context as to the strength of the Illusory Corrupted Monk, I recommend going back to that entry if you chose to skip to this part. Essentially what makes the true Corrupted Monk different is its utilization of the rejuvenating waters that are described in the game to grant an incredibly resilient body. While we'll delve into why this is in the entry for Genichiro, it goes without saying that the presence of this makes the true version of the Corrupted Monk a much greater threat. As we learn from entries such as Lady Butterfly later in the list, illusions or apparitions are diluted versions of more truer forms, further consolidating its higher position here. It's important to note too that the reason Emma is between the two entries is on the basis of this difference. The Corrupted Monk, having descended from the Okami tribe and appointed a premier position, makes her a tried and tested warrior fit for the purpose of guarding their greatest secret the Divine Dragon. When we consider Tomoe descended from this tribe and too once held a premier position in the clan, we can assume the true corrupted monk is somewhat adjacent to Tomoe's power and influence, albeit dulled by her infested form and lack of accolades comparable to Tomoe. Boasting the strongest aspects of the rejuvenating waters, the power of the Okami tribe, and what seems a long and successful tenure as the guardian of the Okami tribe's most treasured secret, it's not surprising why the true corrupted monk is not only trusted as a final defense mechanism, but also the first defense mechanism in its illusory form, something we rarely see for other characters already in the game. My name is Kyobu Masataka Oniwa! As I breathe, you will not pass the castle gate! 
In many ways, ranking Yobu is one of the most simple tasks in this list. He's not a esoteric figure, nor is he a being of legend. He's a simple warrior with extraordinary strength. The story of Gyobu begins during his time as a leader of a group of bandits that was defeated by Ishin Ashina. Ishin during this period was honing the craft of the Ashina style, and although ruthless in winning his battles without hesitation, he also paid a great deal of respect to his fellow combatants, as it would be aspects of their style that would breed the foundations of the Ashina style in his later years. We see the greatest example of this respect when Ishin would come by Gyobu's bandits. Naturally, Ishin would bring them down. However, in this instance, he spared Gyobu, not because Gyobu begged for his life and asked for forgiveness, rather the opposite. Gyobu fought ruthlessly and with such great strength that Ishin was impressed by the rugged shinobi. He would recruit Gyobu under his own wing, and we learn a close bond would build between the two, and no doubt, knowing how Ishin values his friends, this was on the merit of his ability to fight. Unsurprisingly, Gyobu would land himself within the inner circles of the Seven Spears, and would likely even have one of the greatest roles in the coup against Tamaru, something evidenced as Ishin would award Gyobu Tamaru's spear, likely due to his valiant efforts during the Civil War, but also Gyobu's strength showing parallels to the great Tamaru. If we give Dragon Spring Sake to Ishin, we learn Gyobu settled among the ranks of Owl and Lady Butterfly, both shinobis that come much later in the list due to their respective achievements and power. And as Gyobu stands adjacent, at least in the eyes of Ishin, to them, it elevates Gyobu's position significantly. Faith in Gyobu's power extends further than just Ishin's own approval. We learn by the time we meet Gyobu, he sits at the gates of Ashina, acting as the final bulwark against any potential threat to Ashina Castle under the command of Genichiro, who of course takes on the premier position as commander of Ashina in Ishin's absence and bad health. Curiously, if we spend time listening to at least two different conversations near the gates, we learn soldiers reiterate the concept that so long as Gyobu is alive, the gates will never be breached. It's clear Ashina held Gyobu to an incredibly high regard. This is further echoed as Genichiro places Gyobu as his second in command, something that makes sense as those second to Ishin were the inner circle of the Seven Spears. But in the absence of Owl and Lady Butterfly, naturally Gyobu was chosen, further consolidating the fact that Gyobu as a war-hardened shinobi is second only to those closest to Ishin. Wielding Tamaru's spear, carrying the blessings of Ishin and Genichiro himself, Gyobu is still alive and well at the point we meet him, having already killed hundreds of Interior Ministry forces, as evidenced by the littering of bodies through the battlefield. The Interior Ministry, including their lone shadow shinobis, told to be masters of war, were no ordinary threat, and as he stands alone against the mountain of their corpses, we truly learn why Gyobu stands here on the list, as one of the greatest shinobi of the Ashina clan, trusted to stand alone affront the towers of the castle. Lady Butterfly is a difficult one to rank, as in many ways her story is never her own, rather the place she stood alongside others. Of course, this is most prevalent with the story of Owl. While Owl's entry is for later in this list, what we can say here is that Lady Butterfly stood closely with Owl, but also with Ishin and is pronounced by Ishin if we give him the Dragon Spring Sake, as friends from before the coup, placing her in his inner circle, already an incredibly esteemed position. The rest of her story relies on Owl. We learn from the remnant of Lady Butterfly that her role in our timeline mostly revolved around mentoring us. As a careful practitioner of illusions, which I'll add is a one-of-a-kind trait we witness in the game, she would be responsible for bringing Sekiro to shinobi status. This alone would place Lady Butterfly quite high, as unlike other Souls games, our character is a named being in the game, and we can therefore attribute the successes of Sekiro and his natural talent to to the teachings brought down from Lady Butterfly, elevating her further. 
The most unique aspect of Lady Butterfly is of course our encounter with her in the Hirata Estate Memories, where we go face to face for a battle for Kuro. While the backstory as to why we have to fight Lady Butterfly here is non-conclusive, there are some great theories about why the fight even takes place. As we'll learn in Owl's entry, the memories of the Hirata estate play out the devious brilliance of Owl's scheming ways. Owl hell-bent on obtaining the dragon's blood from Kuro and receiving the gift of immortality for himself, tactically plots an attack against the Hirata estate when the Ashina warriors stationed at Hirata are off on an expedition. In their absence, Owl baits the Jozu bandits to attack, something we can learn through a conversation with the information merchant. It's likely Owl was going to use the chaos of the bandit attack as a means to obtain Kuro for himself. However, once we enter the memory, we see what seems to be a mortally wounded Owl, which too was likely an extension of Owl's scheming to have us enter the Hirata estate on behalf of himself. As we find out, he never truly was injured. Why Owl asks us to do this rather than doing so himself is unclear, but there are some great theories. The first is that Owl and Lady Butterfly were working together to take Kuro and therefore the dragon's heritage. This would mean Owl sent us in in order for us to face doom against Lady Butterfly. And if we succeeded against Lady Butterfly, it doesn't really matter as Owl is going to finish what's left with a backstab anyways. The other theory is that Owl is contending against Lady Butterfly, asking us to defeat her and then backstabbing us to finish off all loose ends. This theory is much more Owl-like as the tactical nature of this lends itself to what we already know about Owl as a character. This theory also equates a great deal of power to Lady Butterfly as a character that even the great Owl in his prime was unwilling to go against. The battle with Lady Butterfly is unlike most other battles as for the first and only time in the game we are against a master of illusion. We learn that this talent transcends just usual trickery as although Lady Butterfly does use some trickery such as the use of wires to suspend herself, we learn she also has the ability to alter the mind of others. We see this immediately when we enter the Hirata estate as Kuro, the heir to the dragon's bloodline, is seen wandering around seeing only butterflies. Sekiro, a student of Lady Butterfly, immediately knows that Kuro is under a illusory spell and acts quickly to alleviate Kuro's mind. But more importantly, we see this illusory talent on the first phase of our battle with Lady Butterfly. We learn quickly the first phase was purely an illusion. And it's clear this isn't just a mind trick. We can indeed die to this form and the illusion itself hosts a one-to-one -one spitting image of Lady Butterfly, further testament to how powerful her illusions can be as a real threat. When we successfully dispel this illusion, we can face her in her true form. And true to her name, she maintains the fleeting form of her illusion, but also has the unique ability to summon apparitions and cast projectiles. When we equate her proficiency in illusory arts, a skill that no other entity in the entire game is able to demonstrate this magnitude of effectiveness with, and then add the context that she, just like Owl, were in the inner circle of Ishin's shinobis responsible for overthrowing Tamaru's regime, we are looking at not only one of the greatest shinobis in Ashina, but also a dynamic threat that makes her more than just an orthodox powerful shinobi. As we have said earlier, her strength may even be the reason Owl asked us to confront her as he feared going face to face with her during the events of the Hirata estate. Or alternatively, the great Owl saw Lady Butterfly as equally as suitable as himself or more suitable to taking down Sekiro, measuring her strength at least as somewhat adjacent to Owl's. This holds a lot of weight when we learn later about how canonically powerful Owl was both in his prime and in his contemporary form. We also know that Lady Butterfly mentored Wolf into becoming a shinobi, and as Sekiro, unlike other From Software games, gives the protagonist a backstory and a canonical position in the lore, we know much of our initial talent and later successes in the game have Lady Butterfly to thank for it. Because remember, when we enter the role of Wolf, we are already a very capable shinobi, powerful enough to essentially beat the entire game without any extra skills. It's for these reasons Lady Butterfly ranks here on the list.
I love this entry because it lets me go into the life of one of my favourite characters in the entire game. The Demon of Hatred is the story of Sejiko, a man we know as the Sculptor or even Orangutan. While the Demon of Hatred's identity is initially elusive, if we were paying any attention, we learn that these are both the same beings. Another reason I love this entry is because it lets us, for the first and only time, speak about the concept of Shura in detail. Shura is a phrase thrown a lot in the game. Shura as a concept refers to the real world Japanese demigod of war who fought an endless battle in a relentless and inhumane manner. Sekiro takes a few liberties with the concept of Shura and asserts all humans have the capability to become Shura or in the words of the sculptor become consumed by it. If one is a successfully unstoppable enough combatant and seeks to kill for the sake of killing itself or without direct purpose aside from the joy they get from killing, they have the capability of becoming Shura. In this sense, Sekiro goes ahead and personifies what we already know as Shura into a physical form that manifests itself naturally, echoing common Buddhist ideals. Karma pins this concept as we learn all shinobi inherit the karma of those they've killed and therefore internalise that karma. While it may seem inevitable that any successful shinobi are destined to become Shura, we know karma can be balanced, which is precisely why fervorous killers like Ishin were able to save off being consumed by Shura through techniques such as the breath of nature, a non-indulgent practice that forces internal balance and posture, expelling regret and therefore for the burden of others' karma, while alternatively killing mindlessly compounds regret with no method of exhalation. There are two major plot points that refer to Shura. One is our own pathway to becoming or being consumed by it. The other details the story of a man that averted this reality. The sculptor's story is something we can get quite familiar with. He is our host after all, and a majority of the gameplay progression revolves around interacting with him. His consistent appearance is intentional as it foreshadows a few potential endings for us. But the story of the sculptor takes us back in time during a period he was only known as Orangutan, a name built off his reputation as a rogue shinobi that would spend a majority of his time learning alongside a peer in the art of war and the dexterous movements of a monkey. We learn during this period he would become so proficient with moving swiftly and defeating his foes without a single mistake he would affectionately be referred to as Orangutan. During this period with his partner shinobi he would build affectionate memories memories as they both trained in the valley. After giving the sculptor monkey booze, he tells us he and his partner were masterless as no one would truly understand their bond. But one day the partner Shinobi would disappear. This of course refers to the story of King Fisher we've already detailed in the previous entry with the Guardian Ape. We are given more exposition regarding the sculptor's story when we delve into the story of Emma. As we have already discussed, her story is not too dissimilar to ours. Emma's family were killed in the coup, however unlike us she was greeted in pure kindness. She tells us she came across a monkey that offered her a rice ball, an act of kindness that she would hold on to. It's likely that the monkey in question was indeed Orangutan during his time as a shinobi and his involvement in Ashina's coup. And as the civil war raged on, Orangutan would demonstrate himself to be an incredibly capable force. It's likely the time of this war would coincide with the loss of his compatriot that we now know as King Fisher. As we have already discussed, this compatriot was his closest friend, the one person that shared his path to becoming a shinobi in the valleys of Ashina. With grief in his heart and a war yet to be won, Orangutan would become an absolutely vicious fighter, slaughtering thousands during his time. And once the coup ended, continued an onslaught of killing void of any objective, laying the groundwork to become Shura. We learn Orangutan's success came with his proficiency with fire, a symbol of the shadow of Shura stirring within him. Ishin, representing the antithesis to Shura, would acknowledge Orangutan's rampage and amputate his arm, rendering him unable to continue utilising his signature fire, stopping him from becoming Shura. We are never told of any other entity in the game getting this close to becoming Shura, and we are explicitly told that if Ishin did not preemptively strike against Orangutan, he would, without a doubt, have become Shura. 
Shura as a physical manifestation would likely be one of the greatest threats in the entirety of the game, as we find out during the Shura ending that our character as Shura would be an unstoppable force, akin to a true demon. Sekiro as Shura is outright referred to as a god by the item Another's Memory Shura, which tells us memory of Shura, told via Ashina folk song. Fields of bodies, mountains of dead, down Dragon Spring River our country bled, a fiery god, demon wolf in red, which essentially elevates us to a station reserved for one other being, the divine dragon. However, not all Shura are equal, and we are not given any concrete evidence that Orangutan as Shura would mirror the same being we become during this ending. But by extension of being the only character referred to as being this close to becoming Shura, this lends incredible credit to the fighter Orangutan was, consolidated by the fact that Ishin had only ever once had to stop another becoming Shura, as evidenced by the dialogue we get after treating him to monkey boo. By the time we meet Orangutan, he is known as the Sculptor, condemning himself to carving idols to atone for his internalised bad karma. Through the majority of the game, the Sculptor acts as a hub for us, even initially saving us from Genichiro and granting us a prosthetic limb. This limb was an artefact initially given to him by Dogen, refined to near perfection. His passing over of this item symbolises the foreshadowing of our own fate as Shura, or even a Sculptor, but also a second second life unburdened by the initial stagnation of the Iron Code. While Ashina is in the midst of the Interior Ministry's assault, while we've left in search of the Mortal Severance, we learn the Sculptor finally accepts the inevitability of his fate as a subject to Shura, and as the Information Broker tells us, he rampages towards the Interior Ministry for one final battle, and the release of an aspect of Shura finally fighting with purpose to protect Ashina. When we meet the sculptor in this form, we learn he has become the demon of hatred, a monster in all capacities hosting a fiery arm in place of his lost limb. While this is not a fully fledged Shura, we know this is the closest aspect of Shura we are able to fight in the entire game. And as bodies of many shinobis litter his final frontier, we can face off against the demon. Enveloped in fire, this battle reminisces on what made Orangutan the fierce unstoppable force he used to be, which is then compounded by his new demonic form, the aspect of hatred, something that personifies Shura the most. Remember, Orangutan was so fierce that for the first time in Ishin's life, he had to step in to stop him, something not echoed for many other shinobi, including Owl, who as we'll find out is one of the greatest shinobis in the game with a penchant for becoming Shura himself. And if we then equate what we know of Sekiro becoming Shura as what is likely the greatest power the game has ever seen, akin only to a god, the demon of hatred adjacent to this fact holds a position as one of the greatest threats in the entire game, something quite nicely echoed by the boss fight itself. I've died to this boss too many times to count. The story of Ishin Ashina encapsulates the most important conversation in the narrative of Sekiro, and at the heart of this is his strength. Ishin Ashina is the namesake of the Ashina clan, responsible for the coup that would overthrow the tyrannical Tamaru who once oversaw the province. Strength is laden throughout Ishin's entire life. We learn even during his time under the rule of Tamaru, Ishin fought hard and fast, claiming victories and honing a style of combat that picked at the strengths of all of his foes. It was Ishin's respect for his opponents that consolidated their memories into his own fighting style, and the blade his vehicle to retell these stories. It's this belief that grounds the rules of the game itself. Sekiro, taught under Wolf, who too was inspired by the Ashina style, requires reconciling memories to grow stronger and more talented. Although Ishin's earliest years are never spoken of, in many ways it's not necessary, as his story really begins at the moment he formed the Seven Spears of Ashina. As already spoken of, these were comprised of warriors in the land that shared an ideal to overthrow Tamaru. Ishin, by the virtue of his talent alone, gained the confidence of warriors across the region and even converted bandits into a life of loyalty to his cause. At the foot of this civil war, Ishin led the rebellion to victory, slaying Tamaru 
Tamaru. Tamaru's power is never spoken of directly, but from the cutscenes and dialogue clues, it's clear Tamaru represented a power so deep that the region, regardless of their clear dissatisfaction to his despotic leadership, bowed to him. However, rising above the litter, Ishin was able to defeat the great Tamaru and claim the region as his own dominion, a land built under his own principles, and our first taste of the true power of this great warrior. Ishin would continue leading Ashina and raising a cohort of warriors under the Ashina style, a form of combat that, as the One Mind skill suggests, focuses their entire soul into the release of the blade. A lot of the successes and power of individuals under his leadership in many ways owe their prowess to his influence, and when we contextualise Emma's strength, Genichiro's, and even the power of the Seven Spears to this, we are truly given a picture of what strength Ishin had as the source of this influence. Further context as to Ishin's strength can be seen in his relationship to the all-elusive Tomoe. Although we never get a true backstory for Tomoe, we can learn from item descriptions that she was a warrior aligned to the Okami clan, but more importantly outright described as divine. Her power echoed the strength of a god itself in the form of the divine dragon better than any other being in the entire game, and is likely responsible for sharing this art to the Okami clan and even Genichiro. We'll get more context as to Tomoe's strength in the later entry for Genichiro, but what we need to know here is that she was a being that mirrored the power of the greatest aspects of Sekiro himself. Tomoe is described as sharing the same goal to sever the dragon's heritage, and even aligned herself with the dragon's heir of her time, just as we do, but in the form of Kuro's ancestor, Tekeru. When we ask Ishin about his relationship to Tomoe, he describes an encounter with her as the closest he's come to death, relating his power as comparable to Tomoe's, suggesting Ishin in his prime could stand toe to toe with a literal divine warrior. However, the Ishin we are speaking of today is very different to his sword saint past. He is currently under a life-threatening ailment that has clearly brought down Ishin to a much weaker state. It's inferred from the dialogue of the Interior Ministry's spies that the Interior Ministry only chose to act on their plans to invade Ashina on the realisation Ishin was afflicted with this ailment, suggesting the power of Prime Ishin is what held back the ferocity of the Interior Ministry for the entire timeline up to this point. So how powerful is Ishin in this form? Well, we get our first insight into this when we meet a peculiar samurai referred to as Tengu. It doesn't take long to realise this is indeed contemporary Ishin. He has taken arms and is hunting rats. The rats in question are the interior ministries and, in some cases, the Senpu Temple's spies. But it seems it's not just the spies Ishin was able to dispatch, as whenever we do meet Ishin in this Tengu persona, his station is littered with the dead bodies of the Interior Ministry's greatest warriors, referred to as the Lone Shadows. While the context of the Interior Ministry's form of combat and prowess is never directly spoken of, it's clear they were an incredibly capable force for more than just their numbers. We can see the devastation these warriors took towards the end of the game as the Interior Ministry's forces cut down a vast majority of Ashina's own men. It's clear they had proficiency in all forms of weaponry and the Lone Shadows were the elite members of their arsenal. Shinobis too, the Lone Shadows were granted the confidence of the Interior Ministry to carry out the most sensitive tasks, and this duty befit their strength. Considering Ishin was able to single-handedly take on a wide range of these warriors is further evidence that even at death's door, he was still incredibly powerful. A statement reiterated by the memory of Ishin, which states Ishin Ashina was a true master of the sword, no less in his veil of years. But our true encounter with Ishin as a boss is what truly gives us the image of his power at this stage of his life. Upon Emma's defeat, Ishin, as he had done in the past, intervenes as a means to stop you from becoming Shura. This fight is a perfect exemplification of the rawest tenets of the Ashina fighting style, utilising the Ashina cross, Ichimonji, and most importantly one mind and little else. As Ishin is the only being noted to be able to utilise one mind, we can infer that he, even at his old age, comes out on top as the greatest soul practitioner of the Ashina style, while other entries later in this list take out on top due to their more dynamic utilisation of fighting styles, and more importantly their good health. If we're going by who in the contemporary time was the most powerful Ashina styled shinobi, this title still sits with Ishin Ashina, despite his withered form. 
It's in this reasoning that I place Ishin above the Demon of Hatred, as it was the utilization of his skills as an Ashina warrior that once stopped Prime Orangutan from becoming a Shura, and I believe with the evidence of the One Mind skill, iterating he maintains a great degree of his proficiency over the Ashina style, that he again would be able to overcome Orangutan as the Demon of Hatred. This is further made apparent as it was Ishin that would teach Emma into becoming a Shinobi, and she was taught specifically with the intention of stopping stopping Ashura if it came to it. Ishin, as her mentor, likely was still well versed in doing so, and from the description of the One Mind spell, solidifies that he could damn well do it again. To acknowledge the elephant in the room, the Genichiro I'll be ranking will be the version we battle at Ashina Castle and at the end of the game, rather than the one we fight in the earlier portion of the game. While there is a major disparity between the two, such as the absence of the Mortal Blade and Genichiro choosing not to engage the Way of Tomoe, the first battle is one we are destined to lose and Genichiro is intentionally withdrawn in this fight. Everything I could say about the first encounter with Genichiro is an unfinished version of what I can say here, as Genichiro never chooses to use the way of Tomoe in this fight and is ultimately aided by an accomplice in defeating us before we are able to witness him in his full potential. The first battle with Genichiro is not a complete boss battle. There is no win or lose state and we don't even get a chance to see Genichiro utilize this full potential. That being said, the battle with Genichiro in Ashina Castle and at the end of the game, although still not a battle we can truly kill Genichiro in, demonstrates every aspect of Genichiro in full swing. We are truly battling a fully realized version of the heretical grandson of Ishin. The story of Genichiro helps us understand Genichiro's philosophy in combat, but also his most distinct feature, the aspect of Tomoe. While Genichiro is referred to us as the grandson of Ishin, he was, much like Wolf, adopted. While Genichiro was not adopted from the war-torn battlefields of the Ku, he was taken in by Ashina after his mother's death. No other context is given here, however it's clear that Genichiro was raised closely to the royal family and even Ishin, to a degree that would have him elevated from a boy who was destined for peasantry to a figure in charge of the nation under the blessing of Ishin himself. It's not surprising therefore to find that Genichiro always felt indebted to Ashina, the nation that granted everything to a boy destined for nothing. This belief would entrench Genichiro's hallmark trait, his rampant nationalism. Genichiro tells us he would shed humanity itself for the sake of Ashina. By the time we are introduced to the game, Ashina is in big trouble. The Interior Ministry, sensing Ishin's ailing state, wages a war of unification, seeking to bring fictional Japan under one rule. Outmatched in strength, numbers, and technology, Genichiro looks inward to formulate the material conditions to defend Ashina, and in doing so looks to the old dragon's blood as a means of gaining immortality and fighting against the progressing Interior Ministry, indeed damning his own humanity for strength and a self-proclaimed heretic form. In our encounter against Genichiro, he has already consumed what is known as the rejuvenating sediment, a concentrated aspect of the rejuvenating waters associated with the divine dragon spring. While not immortal, this granted Genichiro a blackened body, making him near impervious to fatal blows. His final act would be attempting to retrieve the dragon's blood through Kuro and granting him real immortality. However, rejected by the air, we face off against Genichiro to finally put to rest his ambitions and threat to our master. While we will delve into the aspect of the Black Mortal Blade alongside the Way of Tomoe soon, Genichiro, even in his regular form, is notably formidable. While we don't know what aspect of Ishin was cast into Genichiro's fighting style, it's clear he takes Ishin's adage more intensely than even Ishin himself. This of course being the philosophy that winning a battle is of the utmost importance. Genichiro's ordinary fighting style does indeed collaborate many of the important ideals of of Ishin, aspects we see in various moves he utilizes, such as the Ashina Cross. His grounding as a powerful Ashina Shinobi is solidified further too by his position as the commander of the army, a position Ishin must have intended for Genichiro to take. However, more important to Genichiro's strength is the influence of Tomoe. 
Ishin tells us that the lightning of Tomoe was brought to the mortal realm by Tomoe, taught to the Okami tribe, but more importantly to Genichiro. As Tomoe was Genichiro's mentor and likely the figure that brought Genichiro to a level of a shinobi that he would later become, Genichiro was so powerful that Ashina and even Ishin himself would reserve a premier position in the clan for Genichiro. We never get to meet Tomoe, so we have little context as to her direct strength. But we are told by Ishin that Tomoe was so powerful, he himself saw her as his equal, even during his prime. Her fighting style was akin to dancing, and we are told her hallmark was the utilization of lightning. No other being in the game, including Ishin, were able to command magical elements to this extent aside from Tomoe. Lightning itself is likely the most raw assertion of power in the game, as it was born from the Divine Dragon, and it is the only way of bringing the Divine and dragon to submission in that boss battle, as during that boss battle we are required to reflect lightning back towards it as the only means of bringing it down. Genichiro's use of Tomoe's teachings can be seen during his final phase, where he summons upon the Way of Tomoe. Utilizing lightning and bowmanship associated with Tomoe, this is likely the closest we get to the true power of Tomoe in the main game without actually meeting her ourselves. In this battle too, Genichiro is holding yet another aspect of Tomoe, the Black Mortal Blade, a weapon on par with the Red Mortal Blade, the most powerful artifact in the entire game. Genichiro would get a hold of this through his association with Tomoe and likely retained possession of this blade since her passing. The Black Mortal Blade's nature is coated in mystery, but we learn the blade can be translated to Open Gate, a bridge between the living realm and the spirit world. Ishin refers to Genichiro resorting to using this blade as abandoning oneself, echoing again that Genichiro is willing to give everything to defend Ashina. While the Black Mortal Blade is not present during one of the boss encounters with Genichiro, for the reasons of this ranking, I'll associate the power level of Genichiro in tandem with both the Black Blade and the Way of Tomoe in one place, as we do get to face both in later segments of the game. If you want a separate ranking, Genichiro without this blade would be just below this ranking, as I'm willing to concede some degree of extra strength granted by the Black Mortal Blade to Genichiro's arsenal. While acknowledging the Black Mortal Blade may do little outside of granting Genichiro the ability to bring back beings from the dead and potential to grant mortal severance to the dragon's heritage, as little else is spoken of regarding the mortal blade in terms of strength. With all this being said, Genichiro is in almost every way a living aspect of Tomoe. Emma tells us he fought and learned with Tomoe in the Fountainhead Palace. However, there is one major caveat. In the Shura ending of the game, we learn Owl even in his lesser present form as contextualized by the foster father's memory that states he was in his prime during the past events of the Hirate estate, is able to absolutely decimate Genichiro, decapitating him and even taking his black mortal blade, suggesting Owl was able to defeat Genichiro even during Genichiro's absolute prime, way of Tomoe and black mortal blade in tow. Rarely in lore related rankings do we get to see a one to one boss comparison in this fashion, and it makes my job easier in assessing Genichiro not as a perfect mirror of Tomoe, rather empowered by the teachings of Tomoe, but still lesser than the great Shinobi Owl. Later in this list, we will confront Inner Genichiro. We learn from the remnant of Inner Genichiro that the present Genichiro during his life on Earth never did reach the heights of Tomoe, and Owl being able to bring Genichiro down is just a consolidation of this fact. So we can assuredly say that the present day Owl is more powerful than Genichiro, but we can also assume Genichiro's proficiency in the Ashina style that solidifies his position as the commander of the army, alongside the affinity with Tomoe and even the possession of the Black Mortal Blade, would place him much further above the other great shinobis, and even the present day Ishin due to all aspects of Genichiro spoken of already, and also Genichiro's mastery over Tomoe's fighting style that stood on equal footing to Ishin even during his time as a sword saint in his prime. Although Genichiro is not a spitting image of Tomoe, he stands closest to her legendary status, and his flawless execution of her fighting style, such as the use of lightning and a bow, is not witnessed anywhere else in the game, and it's for this reason he ranks here on the list.
Al's past is plagued in a lot of mystery. Even his name was a later development. We learn from a certain ending and from item descriptions that Owl's true name was Usue. His time as Usue is never elaborated on, but we know he was a careful practitioner of the Iron Code, to follow the commands of one's father first, and then their master. Owl, as one of the closest members of Ishin's inner circle, was directly involved closely with Ishin as they fought off Tamaru's regime, and is responsible for fostering Sekiro from the grounds of that battle, instilling the code to us. Our direction in the game is wholly determined by these teachings from Owl. Owl's involvement in the coup, though a deed that would elevate any character in the game in terms of ranking, is overshadowed to a much greater degree as we go through the game. We learn alongside the coup, Owl is referred to as a Great Shinobi, a careful title echoed by the memory associated with his boss battle. The memory is titled Memory Great Shinobi, suggesting the distinction of great was reserved only for Owl, as even the memory does not distinguish it as Owl of the Great Shinobis, rather just referring to Owl as the Great Shinobi, as if it was common understanding of Owl's esteem. The context of great is rarely granted in the story, even amongst the seven spears of Ashina and even Ashina's inner circle. If we give Ishin Ashina sake, we learn that amongst his inner circle, only Owl, Lady Butterfly, and the Orangutan were the closest in rank and likely power. But regarding Owl's story, there is one huge elephant in the room, this being the memories associated with the events of the Hirata estate. If we travel back in time, we can meet Owl curled over in what appears to be mortal wounds. The Hirata estate had been ravaged by Jozu the Drunkard and his bandits, and had seemed to have gained the upper hand over Owl and decimated the estate. But how does a bandit, albeit a bandit leader of some distinction, gain the upper hand over this great shinobi? Well, we learn as we progress the game that Jozu's assault came with a variety of peculiar circumstances. Those that would survive the assault, specifically the information merchant, tells us that the bandit's assault was far too elaborate and well-timed as it matched the absence of the Hirata shinobis. We can infer this was in fact Owl's handiwork, acknowledging the absence of the Ashina warriors, Owl would bait Jozu's men as a means of causing chaos and kidnapping Kuro for his own gain. In this we learn Owl was not really mortally wounded at the Hirata estate, only playing up to these wounds to lure the meddling of Wolf into the Hirata estate and to face Lady Butterfly, likely to our death. And if Wolf succeeds, Owl himself will sneak up behind a victorious Wolf and literally stab him in the back to finish the job anyway. We learn of Owl's trickery as we return to the original timeline at the Castle Lookout. We learn Owl lived through the events of the Hirata estate, solidifying the belief that it was all a ruse orchestrated by Owl. To further this, we can eavesdrop on a conversation between Owl and Kuro, and we learn that Owl's true intentions are to use Kuro as a means to an end on a pursuit of individual power. Here we can confront Owl and are faced with what is likely the most important decision in the entire game, to obey or dismiss the Iron Code. It's in this dismissal of the Iron Code that we face the version of Owl on this list. But to truly understand how powerful Owl is at this point of the timeline, we have to actually choose the alternative choice, to side with Owl and the Iron Code. This will set a sequence of events that leads to the previously mentioned battles with Ishin and Emma. But between our battle with these two shinobi, we learn that Owl was keeping himself busy too. Although it's not described how, Owl returns back with two important items. Once we defeat both Ishin and Emma, Owl returns wielding a mortal blade of his own, Genichiro's mortal blade, inferring that during our time with Ishin and Emma, Owl set off to kill Genichiro and steal his mortal blade. But we can also learn he did not just steal Genichiro's black mortal blade, as Sekiro fans were able to get a better POV of the cutscene, and we learn in this cutscene where Owl returns, he places Genichiro's decapitated head besides Ishin, indicating a clear triumph over Genichiro, and not just the regular Genichiro we face at the beginning of the game, but the Genichiro that wielded the black mortal blade and utilized the way of Tomoe in his final form. Solid 
identifying this version of Owl to be canonically more powerful than the greatest form of Genichiro, and justifying Owl's place here on the list as Genichiro's superior and the great shinobi of Ashina. From Owl the Great Shinobi to Owl the Father, the next entry is regarding the specific boss battle we face with Owl but during the events of the Hirata Estate on the alternative perspective gained through the events of the purification pathway in the game's story. In this series of events, we are able to revisit the Hirata Estate, but instead are granted access through the Father's Bell Charm. The bell states, the Owl held this bell for a long time. Offering it at the dilapidated temple may result in seeing a different memory than before. There's no way of knowing why this protective bell exists. Perhaps the owl kept it for himself, or perhaps he meant to give it to someone else. While the law of this encounter is foggy as Owl canonically survives up to the point we meet him in the present day as per the last entry on this list, Reddit user Antikupus gives a great explanation drawing attention to the item Remnant Foster Father, which states the battle memory of an extraordinary foe. Although distant, recollections of such a memory provided sustenance for the wolf. Owl took in the hungry cub on a whim and raised him as a shinobi. The process was so engrossing that he hoped they might enjoy a true battle to the death someday. He got his wish, if only in an old memory. This suggests that Owl wished to go one-to-one -one with Wolf to their death one day. However, to plausibly have this battle, Owl recorded a version of himself at the height of his own power in order to give this memory of this greatest form of himself to Wolf to finally fulfil that wish. We know that Owl in this encounter is the greatest version of himself as upon defeat he drops us an item known as memory, Foster Father, where it states the Foster Father confronted in old memories was a man in his prime. Laying credit to the above theory but also adding the context that this version of Owl is much greater than the version we encounter in the present day. I rarely like drawing gameplay to add credit to the list here, but both fights with Owl share many of the same skills and fighting styles, with the stark difference being the utter speed, aggression and nimbleness in the Hirata Estate encounter. Drawing a clear a parallel between the two encounters, ultimately bringing it above the ordinary fight with Owl and solidifying it here on the list. As with all gauntlet-based boss battles, something special happens when we encounter Genichiro's inner form. To contextualise this, let me draw your attention to the item we receive on defeating Inner Genichiro. The remnant of Inner Genichiro tells us a young Genichiro watched as Tomoe danced. Her movements held secrets and a height of technique that not even a lifetime could attain. And yet, in memory, after countless bouts with his mortal enemy, Genichiro at last reached those heights. This lays an important framework in how we can understand both the living Genichiro as already spoken of, but more importantly the inner Genichiro we fight. As we have already stated in the main game, Genichiro is the closest representation to Tomoe that we get in the main game. However, he still pales in comparison to the woman that would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Prime Ishin. However, in the gauntlets we are told he, unlike his present form, did reach those heights of Tomoe. In many ways, therefore, Inner Genichiro is more so a battle against Tomoe. A lot of Sekiro fans draw grievance to the idea that we never got a DLC that put Tomoe at the centre of the game, and therefore never were able to battle Tomoe. However, in a roundabout way, Inner Genichiro is that boss battle. We are told Genichiro watched as Tomoe danced and Genichiro at last reached those heights in memory, suggesting Genichiro in this form, regardless of the gameplay of the actual fight being a recreation of the original fight, would be a Genichiro that fought in the dancing style of Tomoe and utilised the raw power of lightning the way that Tomoe would too. 
Because the greatest insight into Tomoe's strength was from Ishin telling us that her fighting style is the closest he had come to death, we can assuredly assume this form of Genichiro that was Tomoe in every form is a being only comparable to Prime Ishin and therefore far above Owl that would defeat him in the main game but also Owl in his prime. As Ishin the Sword Saint during his premiership is told to be the greatest shinobi that ever lived, greater than all the others including Prime Owl. It's for this reason Inaginichiro ranks above Owl but still below the Sword Saint Ishin, as we aren't truly told Ishin was lesser than Tomoe, rather equal, but I hesitate to put Inaginichiro on par with Ishin the Sword Saint, as even when Ishin and Tomoe lived side by side, Ishin the Sword Saint was still renowned as the greatest shinobi, and Inaginichiro, although a mirror of Tomoe, is not Tomoe herself, placing this version of Genichiro just below the Sword Saint albeit by a small margin. And to finally add another layer of confidence that the Ishin we battle at the end of the game is greater than Tomoe and therefore in a Genichiro, is that the Ishin that is born from the body of Genichiro from the spirit world seems to inherit even aspects of Genichiro, including the art of lightning and aspects of the way of Tomoe, compounding this version of the Sword Saint as the true greater shinobi from the underworld, harboring the totality of his prime, but also the power of Genichiro. Which takes us perfectly to Ishin the Sword Saint. But before I go into Ishin the Sword Saint, I want to quickly clarify why Inner Ishin is on the same ranking here. When it comes to the inner rankings, we learn that these are based on the retellings or memories associated with the character they are based on. While most inner iterations of the bosses have unique aspects to them, those associated with Ishin via the memory of Ishin tell us, even in memory, his cloudless thoughts spurred a relentless pursuit of strength, suggesting the inner version of Ishin, the Sword Saint, is a very accurate depiction of Ishin in life too. Although not sharing the dynamic nature of other inner entries, this is an incredibly fitting description as Ishin in many ways encapsulates the perfect shinobi. His story and fighting style were so prolific even in the memory of Wolf and in the mind of his own, he was exactly the same person as in mind as he was in reality. While characters such as Inner Genichiro are the fulfilled version of the real Genichiro, Ishin was already exactly the person he sought to be, echoing the sentiment that his actions were always accurate and void of hesitation, therefore unburdened by any regrets or shortcomings. Which leads us perfectly to Ishin the Sword Saint and the context as to how powerful he truly was. I won't bore you with too many details about Ishin, as most of his origins and story have already been detailed in his previous regular entry as the present day Ishin. The distinction between that Ishin and the version we fight here is that this version of Ishin is one in his absolute prime. Ishin's legacy is one we encounter throughout the entirety of the game. A majority of combat in the game is derived from the art of war that he instilled into the Ashina clan after his successful coup against Tamaru. If you cast your mind back to the earlier entry, we learn that Ishin honed his combat style through all the victories he had accumulated in his past. The Ashina style is therefore the refinement of the most dangerous aspects of every combat style confronted by the highly tenured shinobi. Ishin tells us that the Ashina style has one major tenet, to win your battles. And it's this mantra that encapsulates the skills that would be taught under the Ashina style. The Ashina cross is quick and non-indulgent. One mind is placing one's entire focus on the release of the blade to achieve godlike speed. This fighting style was not entrenched by flair or spectacle, just the quickest way to kill an opponent without hesitation. While Ishin in his later form demonstrates a devastating utilisation of these skills, it's likely dampened by his old age and more importantly, the terminally fatal illness affecting the legendary shinobi. Ishin the Sword Saint has no such drawbacks. We learn the primary reason the interior ministry sought against marching on Ashina was because Ishin in his prime was far too formidable to qualify an attack against Ashina, and only in his ailing state did it become viable, adding further immensity to his power in comparison to what we already know of the interior ministry. 
But to add a further note, I believe this Ishin that we battle at the end of the game is more than just a prime Ishin unplagued by an illness. It's one that is also compounded by the strength of his grandson, Genichiro. In our previous entry, we learn how Genichiro went further than just the Ashina style in honing his own set of skills, specifically those skills associated to the way of Tomoe. As this version of Ishin is born from Genichiro, it appears testament to Ishin's philosophy, he has encapsulated the most dangerous aspects of Genichiro's arsenal to his own too. Stamped further by what we already know Ishin is able to do in incorporating any fighting style to a much greater degree when added to his own repertoire. This version of Ishin has us pitted against someone that is not only a perfect practitioner of the Ashina style, better than anyone else we've faced to date, but also one that is a master of everything he is able to compound from Genichiro. Ishin here is able to utilize aspects of Tomoe in his own distinct form, including the lightning of Tomoe. Interestingly, this version of Ishin is made even stronger by the fact that he wields the Black Mortal Blade alongside Tamaru's spear and even a pistol, truly bringing to life Genichiro's pursuit of total power on the premise that one should do everything to win a battle. When we face Ishin, we are not only against the greatest shinobi to ever live, but also one that is compounded by the power of Tomoe, Tamaru's old regime, and the technology of the interior ministry in the hands of a true master. Ishin in this state is a true god of war and the perfect representation of Genichiro's final wish to do absolutely anything to save Ashina. Overcoming this challenge unifies everything we have learned up to this point, and defeating Ishin here represents a true mastery over all of the things we have already overcome, just like Ishin had done in the past that granted him the lineal title of the greatest shinobi. Beating this version of Ishin represents the handing down of that lineage to us. Truly a magnificent moment in the game. With all of that being said, this next entry may come as a surprise. After digging into the lore, I think this next entry not only makes sense, but is a perfect symbol of the greatest challenge in the entire game. The trauma of an orphan pulled between two worlds. As we have come to know, the special gauntlet boss battles in this game take a rapid departure from the usual recipe in the main game. At their heart, these are not battles that take place in the usual timeline, rather memories that you can confront. Assessing power is therefore not as comparatively equal, but there is a way of contextualizing the inner battles to the rest of the game. In many ways, this entire ranking list has always been from the perspective of Sekiro. When assessing who is the strongest boss in the game, we are essentially asking who are the greatest bosses we as Sekiro have to confront in the game. While it may have been easy as we have with Inner Genichiro to suggest the inner version of Owl is just an elevated battle in the mind of Wolf, the description of the item Memory Inner Father tells us this inner boss we confront is very different to those already spoken of earlier. The description states, deep within the mind the father stirred. The man Wolf confronted in memory was more than Owl could have ever hoped to be. In this we learn that Owl in Wolf's mind did not represent the one-to-one -one power of Owl or even Owl at his prime, rather the impact Owl had to Wolf's mind, which was much greater than Owl physically could ever be. As already discussed, a core tenet of the game has always been our obedience to the Iron Code and the lasting power Owl had imprinted onto us even before we took a hold of Sekiro as a protagonist. We know Sekiro so obedient to Owl and the Iron Code literally sat idle on Owl's departure, awaiting command before acting in any form. We only truly start our journey on the command of Kuro, Owl's chosen second in command and our master. While we journey through the game, we face challenges that force our character to make their own decisions, something unfamiliar to Sekiro up until this point. It's these choices that challenge the fabric of the Iron Code as we, for the first time, are progressing our own fate without the peering eyes of our father. Kuro casting a much more forgiving and liberal approach to decision making allows us to develop our own moral compass and individual assertions for the first time. We choose outcomes of questlines, 
cast judgments of our own, and make crossing decisions that bear impact on Ashina as a whole. But throughout this journey, there are still flash moments where we cannot make decisions that go against the Iron Code. Dialogue choices indicating we are still bound by the memory of Owl, even in his perceived permanent absence, or even in the mind of Wolf at this point, abandonment. This internal dialectic comes to a head when we finally face Owl at the peak of Ashina and are asked to make the decision to either obey the father or obey the master. This single choice is the most impactful decision you can make in the entire game. If we choose to side with the father, we have to physically confront the emotional bonds we have developed with affectionate characters such as Emma, Kuro, and even the ailing Ishin. But there is a reason this option is even granted. While most players at this point, having developed affection and personal relation to the causes espoused by Kuro and Emma, are likely to convincingly choose against Owl, we can't help but understand why this decision is even granted to us, as Sekiro adopted from what is likely the brink of death and destitution was saved by Owl but also challenged by Owl to receive acceptance and gratefulness for this act by forcing Sekiro to go through treacherous trials as a boy to legitimise himself as worthy of life. Lady Butterfly's remnants tell us Sekiro was forced to learn to become a shinobi through strict methods and likely life or death battles too. It would not be a stretch to suggest in the moment Sekiro is asked to choose between Owl or Kuro, he has to confront what is likely the hardest challenge in the entire game, appeasing the unloving father in an attempt to finally, after years of trauma, win his affection and legitimise our heritage or challenge your trauma and acknowledge and overcome consistently being used as a means to an end by a father that would never and has never loved you since the day you were found on the battlefield. While the choice itself is a single dialogue option in the game, the battle with the inner father is this decision as it plays out in Sekiro's mind. When we fight Owl in the gauntlets, to me this is a chance for us to overcome the greatest aspect of trauma in Sekiro's mind. For Owl as a physical being was never going to be greater than the mental trauma and challenge that Owl represented in Sekiro's mind. The memory of the inner father tells us deep within the mind the father stirred. The man wolf confronted in memory was more than Owl could have ever hoped to be, consolidating the inner father as the true greatest threat to Sekiro, unrepresentative of the physical power of Owl, but representative of the greatest challenge for Sekiro, who of course is the true greatest character in the game, placing the inner father this high on the list. The Inner Father boss battle is the mental contention between us choosing to remain a starving wolf or becoming Sekiro of Ashina. Unlike our previous video in Bloodborne, the story of Sekiro is built around people, the best laid plans of mostly well-seeking characters. As we have learned, Genichiro symbolised the aspect of unwavering justice, spliced with uncapped ambition. If Genichiro, descendant of Ishin Ashina, was to preserve his ancestors' heritage and the culture of the region, he had to battle the advancing imperialist forces of the Interior Ministry to legitimise their right to self-preservation. However, the Interior Ministry coated in advanced armaments and sheer scale had the physical force. Genichiro, at this realisation, adopted a Machiavellian archetype and pledged any means to preserve Ashina, opening his character to uncapped ambition, but also a lack of foresight. In a mirrored sense, leader of the clan Ishin, although sharing the same idea of self-preservation and justice, disavowed relinquishing ethics in the face of this campaign. Ishin embodied justice and a fierce non-materialist view in attaining justice through hard and fast codes and ethics. The story of Sekiro prides its entire narrative on this binary dialectic not only between Genichiro and Ishin, but also characters like Owl and Kuro, stagnation and flow, the very existence of karma, and of course, centipedes and dragons. 
In a lot of ways, Sekiro, our protagonist, although bearing his own voice, story, and background, unfamiliar to the recipe Souls-like games often adopt, is still a medium for us, the player, to choose how we are to tip the scales in the game. At the heart of this balance is the existence of the Divine Dragon, as who is better to tip the scales than a being that originates from outside the very confines of mythical Japan? We are told the Divine Dragon is from the West. The otherness of this term is intentional, as the way we involve the influence of the dragon in the game determines which dialectic comes out on top. Genichiro wants to use the Divine Dragon's influence on a quest for immortality, and therefore strength, while Ishin seeks to sever the dragon's influence to relinquish immortality and therefore the prevailing threat of dragon rot, which is deforming the physical, mental, and cultural significance of the Ashina clan. It's therefore not surprising that in a game about people and names, stories and individual assertions on the right thing to do, the Divine Dragon is not a person. It's referred to as a god, a being untethered to the outcome of the stories, but still integral to the progression of its story. The Divine Dragon therefore wholly exists outside the confines of measurable strength in the human sense. Even reaching the battle is a gargantuan task riddled with enlightenment and rituals. But of course, we are able to go face to face with the Divine Dragon, which begs the question, how on earth are we expected to be able to defeat a god? Which is a pertinent question as the power of the Divine Dragon is as monumental as its influence. We learn that many of the Okami tribe, associated closely with the Fountainhead Palace and even Tomoe, drew their power and affinity to lightning from the Divine Dragon. We can watch the Divine Dragon make use of lightning too, drawing this parallel, but also from what we can learn from Takaru's story in the main game and his dragon heritage influence on Tomoe. As we have come to learn, Ishin Ashina himself referred to Tomoe's form of combat and a battle against Tomoe as the closest he's come to death, and it's not surprising that the Sword Saint Ishin utilises this aspect too in his own fight against us in this form. When we consider how powerful just an aspect of the lightning is in the game, and then understand its origins as related to the Divine Dragon, we are given insight into what to expect from the Divine Dragon's use of this power as its originating source and context as to why it is powerful beyond any levels attainable by humans. We also learn that the Divine Dragon is the source of immortality in the world. The waters originating from it and the sakura trees associated with its blood all allude to the dragon itself as an immortal figure able to grant aspects of its own immortality to others. In this we learn the dragon is impervious to the materials of the normal world and instead harming it would require a mortal blade. Of course this blade is only present once in Senpo Temple and once with Genichiro, and adds the comparative context that no other boss would be able to harm the dragon and even if they could they would end up being against a source of power described as the single most powerful element in the entire game. In overcoming the Divine Dragon, we are forced to use a reversal technique, and it's in this reversal of its lightning attack that we are able to temporarily subdue the god and retrieve its tear. Although no real context is given as to the strength of the Divine Dragon, its influence, its clear ability to swing and create forces of wind powerful enough to cause immense damage on its own, and its origins as the source of power the all-elusive Tomoe was able to harness and gather a reputation akin to, or even more so than Ishin himself, solidify a ranking above all others. Our character Sekiro, much like all From Software games, is a vehicle for us to experience the world and our ability as a human to overcome the dragon should not be indicative that the dragon is in any ways lesser than humanity. As remember, we are only able to do so because of the blessing of the dragon through its heir Kuro. We would not have even had a chance to harm the dragon without its immortality and therefore access to the red mortal blade. In this sense, we can only overcome the dragon purely because the dragon has granted us immortality, essentially defeating itself. 
The Divine Dragon's position, much like dragons in other From Software games, is a symbol of a higher power that contextualizes the ambitions of humans seeking more than their physical components, and it's the merit that the dragon is able to grant this more than human power that solidify it as a great being in Sekiro. I initially hesitated to even add the Divine Dragon to this list, as the delta between its power and the rest of the entire game is immense beyond comparison. Comparison. However, it's in a lot of ways fitting as at the top of the hierarchy of a story of humans striving for dominion in their own little plots of land is a divine dragon uncaring to even influence the outcomes of this struggle, yet holding the power to make more difference than all regular beings combined. Thanks again for making it to the end of this video. For those of you who stuck around, I'll let you into what I'm thinking about for the next few videos. So as the Elden Ring DLC has already been announced, I have a perfect timeline for releasing that video later in the future. But before then, what would you guys prefer to see? Would you prefer a Demon Souls ranked video or alternatively other titles such as Lies of P? I'm completely open to any ideas you guys have. And as a final note, thank you for your continued support. As a small channel, the engagement of this community makes a huge difference. I appreciate you all, and I'm sure I'll see you guys in the next one.